All right, hello everyone and welcome and thank you for joining CASA and community leadership as we discuss the landscape of the child welfare system during COVID-19. My name is Lindsay Learman and I am the Executive Director for CASA of Adams in Broomfield Counties. Please participate in the opening poll if you have not already done so, we will be closing it shortly. Um, some logistical items I would like to address before starting this evening's presentation is that all cameras for participants have been disabled and microphones muted to lessen connectivity issues. We will also be recording on Facebook Live, so please feel free to visit the CASA Facebook page and share that live feed so that way we can get a CASA. Any questions or comments during the presentation can be directed through the Q&A text box located in your Zoom toolbar, and we will address your questions either during the presentation or at the general Q&A session at 445. If we are unable to address your question during this event, please follow up via the website at casa17th.org or email casa17 at casa17th.com. That is C-A-S-A-1-7-T-H.com. Please note that the Adams County Human Services Building and thus the CASA office will be closed until June 1st. The poll has now cl closed and I will now turn your attentions to a Channel 9 news report to kick off this event. For most of us, this stay at home order is a huge inconvenience, but these empty schools and playgrounds mean fewer eyes watching out for the health and safety of some of these children and their families. And advocacy groups are pretty worried right now. Quiet playgrounds, closed schools. It's been a strange two weeks for Claire Morrow. It is. It has created um, a lot of new opportunities to practice being really flexible. She's a social worker at the Tennyson Center for Children in Denver. Her kids come from families with a history of abuse or neglect. Tough stuff on any day, but lately... We make incredible progress for our kids here at Tennyson, and I've seen a lot of our kids really struggle the last couple of weeks, and. Um, kind of take some steps back, which is really hard to see, and that's what's keeping me up at night. Like everyone else, they've adjusted, moved therapy sessions online, restricted visitors and trips at the center. But Tennyson is worried about the already fragile home environments. Because children, um, unfortunately, are not in school anymore, not going to doctors or anything, there is every likelihood that um, families who are under stress could be engaging in maltreatment or abuse and no one was seen work made so much harder when you can't meet face to face. But it is all work that continues, even through a pandemic. And so I think we just need to show up and be present in kids' lives right now because I don't think we quite yet know what the impact of this is going to be. The Colorado Child Abuse and Neglect Hotline reports a big drop in the number of calls since schools have been closed, but the hotline thinks that could be in part because the mandatory reporters, teachers, child care providers just don't have eyes on a lot of those kids right now. In Denver, Jennifer Meckles, Nine News. That news clip gives us a brief glimpse at how important CASA volunteers are for an additional set of eyes and ears, especially now during these stay at home and safer at home orders. As you will hear throughout the presentation, CASA volunteers are crucial during the best of times. During this unprecedented time, they are of vital importance and needed now more than ever. On that note, I would like to introduce CASA Board Chair Bob Grant to discuss the importance of CASAs. Bob has been a longtime CASA champion, having begun his involvement in 2002, participating in the annual Light of Hope event. Upon his retirement from serving as the District Attorney for the 17th Judicial District, Bob joined the CASA Board of Directors in 2006 and has been tirelessly gaining support for the organization, organization since. We are truly fortunate to have a leader of his caliber. Bob, the floor is yours. Innovations and, and how people have stepped up to make sure that our mission continues unabated is just amazing. Love these guys. Love all of you. Um, I'm introducing some stuff here today. The, uh, the, the, later on, what we're going to do here uh, for the rest of the hour and a half or so is a, a three-part uh, uh, panel focus. We've got a panel on the landscape of the child welfare system. We have a panel on volunteering, and we have a panel on the economy and stability, uh, sustainability that's necessary in order for us uh, in the nonprofit world to continue with our mission. You know, I, uh, I really, really um, echo what the Channel 9 folks said. Uh, 
in these times of uncertainty, there is one thing that is certain, and that is that kids are still being abused. Uh, unfortunately, they're being abused and nobody's watching. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, there's a heightened uh, sense uh, of concern for the safety of kids now. And that's why our CASA volunteers are so, so much more important these days in the time of pandemic. Um, isolation and limited social connections and uh, present real stressors for parents, uh, whether they're inclined to abuse or not. Uh, the, these factors just kind of build up um, and you get higher rates of abuse and neglect, not lower during these times. Um, the risk factors are uh, including the, all of the hardship that people are enduring, uh, all of us, uh, in terms of housing and employment and, and not having access to relatives and, and additional caregivers and uh, all of the isolation and, and the lack of structure that we're, we're experiencing. Um, comes out in, the, in, in various ways. And one of the ways it comes out is, is in abuse, uh, both uh, abuse of a spouse uh, and abuse of kids uh, because they're easy targets. Um, referrals to the hotline are down as they noticed. Uh, most of those referrals, you know, some of them come from relatives, some of them come from neighbors, and most of them come from professionals who interact with kids all the time, uh, doctors, police officers, um, grocery store clerks, um, and, and particularly educators, uh, not just teachers, but the uh, other folks around the school, people that the kids interact with all the time. Um, and federal data, data shows that 4.3 million suspected child abuse calls were made in 2018, and 21% of them came from educators, from folks in the schools. Well, our kids aren't there. They're not there to be seen, but they are there to be seen by you, by our volunteers, by the dedicated folks who care for them. Um, the hotline numbers are down by 50%, according to the Department of Human Services. Abuse isn't down by 50%, I guarantee you that. Um, and they're really concerned about the drop in that uh, number. So if you see something, say something. Um, now more than ever, our volunteers need to be engaged with the kids uh, that, they, uh, that are their clients and with the caregivers. And they have to maintain strong connections to ensure the safety and, and the welfare of, of our kids. Um, our volunteers rock, man. You guys are steady. You're incredible. Um, the things that people have done to maintain contact with their kids have just been, just been over and above. Uh, and we need you to continue doing that. We know that you will. Um, uh, you have restored my faith and elevated my faith in the resiliency of the human spirit. Um, you guys are just incredible. Um, I'm so pleased uh, to be associated with all of you. And when this is all over, and it will be, this too shall pass. Uh, when this is all over, we'll be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and say, we've done good. We've done something to ease the burdens of troubled children in a troubled time. We've shown them uh, caring, concern, and we've given them hope, even in these times of, of uh, uncertainty and scary um, concerns and, and uncertainties that they'll never really understand. So I appreciate you, I appreciate all of you, uh, and let's keep up the fight. Um, we're all in this together, and uh, we're gonna make lives better for children. Thank you for caring. Okay, Lindsay, back to you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you for that much needed information and that inspirational message. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to thank all the human service workers, attorneys, and judges for their continued dedication to the vulnerable children we serve during this unprecedented and challenging time. I want to give a big thank you to our CASA volunteers for their willingness to adjust to new ways of connecting with their children and being that strong support for them during a difficult time, and to our CASA staff for adjusting so quickly and continuing to work so diligently in support of one another and to the children we serve. It is so heartwarming to know the dedication, care, and professionalism that our staff and volunteers portray, and it has never been more evident. And now I would like to introduce Ray Gonzalez, who will be moderating this event tonight. Um, Ray has been a longtime CASA supporter and is a champion of the community in the capacity of Adams County Manager. 
In a time of uncertainty, the county, the county continues to thrive under Ray's leadership, and we are truly grateful for his commitment and tenacity to weather the storm. We will begin with the first panel focusing on the landscape of the child welfare system. Ray, the floor, or shall I say the screen, is yours. Evening. Um, I have the pl pleasure of really moderating a panel um, focused on the child welfare landscape. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our panel members. And the first one um, is Judge Kathy Delgado. Uh, judge Delgado serves as a 17th Judicial District Court judge and has been a longtime CASA supporter. She has many years on the juvenile bench and wholeheartedly believes that CASAs are crucial to her decision-making on cases. Judge Delgado was awarded both National CASA Judge of the Year and Judge of the Year at our local program. Our next panelist is Katie Grego. Katie serves as the Director of Human Services for the best county in the state, and that is Adams County. She provides critical leadership and oversight to a large department that includes many multidisciplinary teams. Her experience in human services comes from the state level and with Arapahoe and Jefferson counties. Katie is a champion for our community. And our last panel member is Missy Salter. Missy Salter has been a CASA volunteer and avid supporter for more than six years. She was sworn in on July 30th, 2013 and started donating that same year. She is currently on her fifth CASA case. Missy embodies every quality in being an effective CASA volunteer. So please join me, join me in welcoming these fine uh, panelists this evening. Uh, the first question is for Katie. Katie, what is the department doing to ensure safety of children when you can't see them in person? Thank you, Ray. It's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, wow, our team has been very creative. Our dedicated staff continue to connect with youth and families via multiple virtual offerings, such as secure apps that can be downloaded to phones, computers, and tablets. They also connect parents with their children in the same way. Families that didn't have a device that would allow for parenting time in this new way were supplied with the much needed technology to stay in contact. After being trained on different approaches to facilitate the virtual meetings, we have seen an increase in engagement of parents with their children and with our department. We continue to provide parents with resources such as financial support, food support, services for kids to maintain social connections, an anonymous hotline for parents to call if they get overwhelmed, and a parent guide about how to set daily structure. In addition, our team is still connected to the courts and are attending via video conferencing. Thanks again for the great question, Ray. Thank you, Katie. And I will just have to say that you have done a phenomenal job of really um, getting our human services department up and running. Uh, Katie is responsible for 800 employees and we were the first county to close in the state back in March, early March. And uh, she issued over 600 laptops and made um, available to our employees so that they could begin services immediately remotely. So congratulations, Katie, and thank you. Uh, the second question is for Judge Delgado. Judge, how are the courts dealing with COVID-19? Uh, thanks, Ray. Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I was actually at the Human Services Building um, the day before it closed, um, and I'm really grateful for the response uh, that the department has had. I was really nervous uh, at the beginning, wondering how we were going to be able uh, to hear cases, to see how kids and families were managing during these very difficult time. Um, and we have been able, uh, thankfully, to conduct court hearings either virtually through a platform called WebEx or through phone hearings. Um, and I am incredibly proud of everyone who works uh, with the courts from our lawyers, our court appointed lawyers, our county attorneys, um, our CASA volunteers who have absolutely been amazing during this time. Uh, we are very busy every day running dockets um, 
in terms of the future, I, I don't know what that's going to look like. I think every day we are mindful of all of the recommendations from uh, Tri-County Health and CDC and want to ensure that before we start bringing uh, families and uh, our stakeholders into the courthouse, that we can all be safe. Um, there's going to be a new, a new normal. Um, my courtroom is generally packed from 8.30 until 5 o'clock every day with people sitting shoulder to shoulder. Obviously, that is not going to uh, be the case in the future. So we will need to figure out a different way of managing our caseload. But given how beautifully everything has gone uh, while we have been staying at home, I'm convinced that we will be able to continue to provide the oversight uh, over uh, our cases and ensure that kids and families are, are staying safe, they're getting the resources that they need. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful for the future um, and really hoping to be in a courtroom really soon. Um, as much as I enjoy the phone hearings and Zoom meetings, I really miss uh, the social aspect of being a judge and being in my courtroom and seeing kids and families um, in my in my courtroom. Well, thank you, Judge Delgado. And again, I just want to acknowledge the great work the um, the courts have done in terms of really responding to uh, COVID uh, in a very responsive manner. And so I just want to thank you for your ongoing uh, service and support. Uh, this next question is for Missy. Missy, can you give us a brief overview of your current case? What are the major changes or challenges you are facing as a CASA volunteer during COVID? Um, thanks, Ray. Um, my current case, um, I have four children, um, range in age from one year old to seven year old. And uh, currently they are in three different foster homes. Um, and what has been um, the most difficult part of COVID is I do not get to see the children in person. I do not get to see them interact with their foster parents. I do not get to see them interact with their biological parents. Um, however, um, due to the ages of the children, um, one-year-old to seven-year-old, um, they um, are honestly a little bit unaffected by um, COVID-19. Um, my oldest kid is in kindergarten and he had just started so uh, he's in a different situation as is uh, his sister and then the two little children um, don't aren't even really aware that they're, they're locked down they're in a different situation so um, I'm trying to make accommodations um, for the kids um, and um, their foster parents um, another issue is that I do not get to see the biological parents interact with their children. So we're trying to make accommodations for that as well. So it's been a, a big change, but I think um, we're all adapting uh, as best we can. And we have the support of um, the CASA community. We have the support of um, the board, we have a lot of support helping us to do the right thing and support these children when it is most important to do that, which is right now. Uh, Missy, just a follow-up question. Have the children responded um, to uh, remote, this new uh, normal, I would say like remotely and virtually? I mean, how are they adjusting to this new normal? Well, the, the two younger children, um, when I video chat with them or Zoom visit with them, um, they're um, less than two years old. So the foster mom shows them me on, on Zoom and I get to see them on Zoom running around and wow. um, having fun. And so they're pretty much unaffected. Uh, the older children, um, I touch base with them about once a week um, on Facebook and read books and uh, to them and try to assist with homework. And um, one, of my, one of my children 
really likes to do um, number patterns. So I write out patterns of um, different things and let him continue the patterns. Um, so my children on my case have responded really quite well. Um, I have been over to um, my oldest child's house before uh, or since two times, once, twice to deliver food and I've gotten to see him through the window and, and wave at him. But they've been not terribly um, affected by this due to their age, for which I'm grateful. Well, that's great that they're adjusting well. And I just wanna acknowledge and remind everyone, Missy has been a CASA volunteer for, it's coming on seven years. And I just wanna thank you, Missy, for your service. Um, we need more volunteers like you, and so thank you. Um, you know, moving me, on to, yes. My pleasure, truly. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, moving on to Judge Delgado. How is knowing that no one is having in-person contact with the youth on the cases you oversee impacting the way you make decision on the cases? Well, I'm, I'm confident um, that the Adams County caseworkers are maintaining um, contact with the children through Zoom. Um, in all of the hearings that I've uh, presided over the last month and a half, I hear that uh, routinely, that they are having access to the children, the guardian ad litems are having access to the children uh, through Zoom. And I also am hearing from some of the GALs who are familiar with the foster homes where the children are placed, that they are actually going into the home um, and the foster parents are comfortable with that. So I, I am not hearing um, anything that is concerning to me. Um, and I, if I felt that there was a concern, I would probably set up a, a Zoom meeting with a child myself so that I could see the child. Um, a GAL recently asked uh, when we are somewhat back to normal and if we're still going to be do, uh, using Zoom or WebEx, whether I would be comfortable meeting with children that way. Absolutely. I love meeting with children. That is something that has been very important to me over my many years uh, serving on the juvenile bench. I have always told CASA volunteers um, and staff that if the children um, aren't comfortable coming to court uh, to meet with me, to please attach a photograph of the child with their CASA report, it's important to me to see the face of the child um, because it's all about them um, and the decisions that I make are about them and I need to see their faces. So. I'm looking forward to seeing kids again. I, I haven't um, seen a child on any of my caseloads since it's been over two months and that's far too long. But I trust um, that the, the caseworkers and the GALs are, are doing their jobs. Thank you. Uh, this next question, what a great transition question to Katie. Katie, from your perspective, what is the role that CASA plays in supporting the children engaged in the child welfare system? Great question, Ray, thank you. CASA continues to play a large support role in connecting children with their parents. Isolation and not having someone there to champion their success is hard on a normal day. With COVID-19, we know for many children it's even harder. They are not able to see their friends, their family, or even their favorite teacher. CASA plays the critical role of connecting children to the supports they need and really truly being their champion, especially in, in this uncertain time. For example, CASA is an extra set of eyes. Their observations are very helpful and they help us assess the family dynamics, risks, and safety issues. CASA advocates, advocates and supports our kids in numerous ways, including providing emotional support, helping connect to activities, helping them get needed supplies, taking a youth to a choice event, and we rely on these efforts very much. So thank you to all of our CASA volunteers. Great, thanks, Katie. Um, Missy, I mentioned earlier that you've been part of CASA since 2013. What would you say to encourage others who are watching to become a CASA volunteer or support the CASA program? Um. That's an excellent question, Ray. Thank you for asking that. Um, uh, being a CASA is a very important um, responsibility and role. And I have found it 
to be something that has been very important um, to me, as well as to the children, as well as to the foster families, as well as to the parents. What I have felt for many years since I became a CASA is I determined that one thing I know for sure in my life is when I am doing, spending any time with CASA, I am spending my time well. And that's very incredibly important previously, but it's even more important now. Um, it's important to the children, it's important to the foster family, it's important to the biological parents, and it's very important and helpful to me to know that there is some time of my day that I am spending making a difference, a true difference in the lives of children, our most vulnerable citizens. So I would encourage anyone to consider becoming a CASA or consider donating to the organization with, 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 with time or finances or anything else. Because you, we are making a difference, and I know that. And it helps me to sleep at night, especially right now. You are definitely making a difference. So thank you again for all your support over the years. And we look forward to having you continue in this capacity for many more. So thank you. I'm going to now turn it back over to Lindsay. Lindsay, uh, the floor or the screen is yours. <laughs> Hi, Ray. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank the panelists again uh, for this first section and just all of your everything that you said and reinforce on the Casa Volunteers. We really appreciate it. Um, at this time, we will um, go straight into the second panel to focus on volunteers uh, just to save some time. And as a reminder, we will have a general question and answer session. If we don't get to it by typing, we'll get to it uh, at the end around 445. Well, Great, Lindsay, thank you. Um, this next panel is really about volunteerism. And so I am going to introduce the panel. Vicki Rickord um, currently serves CASA in the capacity of program director. She has over 10 years of experience with CASA, having served many of those years at the CASA in Louisiana. Vicki brings a wealth of knowledge and has helped to make CASA of Adams and Broomfield counties a leader in the state. Abby Foley is a CASA Outreach and Recruitment Manager. In just over a year with the program, Abby has increased volunteer recruitment by 145% with a pro projected fiscal year end of 110 new CASA volunteers. Abby's innovation approach and her intense drive has helped the CASA program reach more children. Becca Giffen has served as the CASA training coordinator since 2017. She has educated CASA volunteers about the child welfare system and the CASA role. Becca has years of experience in the courts and case management arena. She has adapted the curriculum to fit the current needs of virtually delivery, virtual delivery and a new CASA volunteers rave about her delivery and support. And last but not least, Ben Taylor lives in Westminster, Adams County. His job is to architect is to architect enterprise size companies, disk storage solutions as a sales engineer working for pure storage. Both he and his wife are deeply integrated into the county's youth services sector. And after attending a CASA fundraising lunch, though this would be the best way to contribute to at-risk youth in the county, Ben is one of the first to do the online training due to the county's closures and was recently sworn in as a CASA online by Judge Delgado. So please join me in welcoming this fine panel panelist. The first question is for Vicki. How has CASA acclimated to this new environment? Thanks for the question, Ray. Um, it has been interesting, that's for sure. So with uh, the challenges presented by the pandemic, 
our staff and our volunteers quickly adjusted to remote and virtual work in all facets of the program operations. So despite the, the stay at home and safer at home orders, our incredible volunteers continue to make frequent uh, virtual contacts with their CASA children. Um, they have done a variety of, of different things to uh, engage with their kids, including uh, watching a movie together over video, uh, completing workouts <laughs> over the phone and virtually. Um, and they've even done uh, virtual field trips, which is really fun. So they'll go to the art museum, uh, et cetera. It's pretty, pretty neat. Um, our CASA program team has also started Coffee and Conversations. Um, it's a virtual event uh, each week where CASA volunteers can share their ideas, they can discuss challenges, um, and just stay connected to our team and then to other volunteers as well. Uh, our senior program coordinators are facilitating uh, and sharing lots of different information on uh, advocacy ways uh, during COVID-19 as well. Our next Coffee and Conversation event is going to be coming up on uh, tomorrow, May 13th um, at 11 a.m. So if you're a volunteer, you can reach out to your senior program coordinator or your peer coordinator to find out more about that. Um, and then also, as we are going to begin reintegrating, uh, we've created a plan ensuring social distancing and safety precautions uh, for both our CASA volunteers and the children that we serve. So the details of those things are all on our uh, website, CASA website, under resources for advocates. And they can obviously always go reach out to their senior program coordinator. Great, thank you, Vicki. Uh, this next question is for Becca. Becca, Vicki mentioned an online training platform. Can you please expand on that new platform? Yes, thank you, Ray. Um, currently, we're utilizing um, and have modified a national guided curriculum to deliver the CASA training via Zoom so participants can still interact, share concerns, and ask questions. Um, and that's imperative to giving them the confidence and, the fe and feeling comfortable embarking on this unique volunteer journey. Our first fully remote pre-service training began last week with 23 participants attending. The court has also agreed to conduct swearing in ceremonies virtually so that we can get these new CASAs assigned to cases. We had our first virtual swearing in last Thursday with 17 and we have 23 for the next one. Great. Uh, this next question is for both Vicki and Abby. As Judge Delgado mentioned earlier, in-person hearings have been suspended through June 16th and new cases are still coming into the system. How is CASA handling that? So and we'll we start been, with Vicki. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> so we have been really fortunate. Um, the, the program right now is receiving petitions via email um, and we're still uh, able to assign CASAs uh, to cases right now. So our senior program coordinators are stepping up that provided uh, support and enhanced our support for CASA volunteers taking a case right now helping to schedule and participate in first virtual visits, um, and then also checking in weekly to aid them in creating innovative ways to interact with their kids. Um, as of today, we have served over 475 kids um, this year, uh, and we're really hoping to reach uh, many, many more uh, with our increased volunteer recruitment through COVID-19. Very impressive. Over 475 children. That is very impressive. Congratulations. Vicki, or Abby, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ray. So with these new cases coming in, coupled with really the overwhelming number of child abuse and neglect cases that were already in the system before the pandemic, we have a need to continually bring in new volunteers. Uh, therefore, we've really um, kept outreach and recruitment as a focus and it, it really needs to remain that way even in a remote environment. Um, so we began a recruitment campaign last month in hopes of reaching a new, new audience through Facebook ads and through these targeted ads we were able to reach 11,000 people and we had five individuals inquire about the role and we currently have one person that has applied and is in the current uh, virtual training class this May. 
Um, I have also created a virtual structure for interested individuals to learn more about the CASA volunteer role. I am hosting monthly CASA 101 informational sessions via Zoom, and I'm also speaking with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And then potential volunteers are going through the screening process, um, completing applications online and having interviews via Zoom with program team members. Uh, between the two virtual CASA 101s in April, we had 11 people in attendance and nine of them expressed interest in moving forward with the process and four of these people have already applied. Uh, I will be hosting the next CASA 101 uh, virtually on May 21st from 6 to 7.15 p.m. via Zoom. Well, thank you, Abby. And for those of you watching, if you're interested, please mark your calendars. May 21st from 6 to 7.15 p.m. via Zoom. And you could find that on uh, CASA's website. Uh, moving on to the next question, Ben Taylor. Ben, let's give Ben a virtual applause for being our, uh, being our newest CASA volunteer. Yes, um, and uh, so Ben, can you tell us about your inspiration behind becoming a CASA and how the process went virtually? Yeah, thank you, Manager Gonzalez. I attended a CASA fundraising lunch last year, which sparked my interest in the mission. And our family has been working with youth services for many years in both Adams County and Australia. And it was my first exposure to this in Adams County. Um, and we see a huge need for youth support at the county level. Um, we also expect to see a huge surge in cases uh, just due to the fact that we are, uh, you know, under the COVID-19 lockdown and stay at home. And uh, I've got a partic particular interest in supporting youth who are often marginalised uh, and require assistance. Um, as for the virtual classes, they were very, very well run, very well attended. Everybody turned up and it, um, the internet connections were just fine. Um, they were complemented with videos and sound bites. Uh, and the interaction was similar to, to being there in the class where we had breakout groups and group work. So to be honest, I actually uh, enjoyed it just as much uh, and learned just as much at the same speed as I was, I would have been in the classroom. What would you say to others to get involved, Ben? Yeah, for others to get involved, I'd say there's going to be, and there already is a huge backlog of cases and demand that requires local people like me to donate their time and skills to the long-term health of kids in our uh, in our county. Um, the onboarding process is easy, um, but as I take my first case, I think the cases will be more difficult than I've expect. Um, I believe they'll be more emotional. There'll probably be uh, a lot more time involved than I originally thought, but I'm looking forward to that challenge. Great. Thank you. Um, we will turn it over to Lindsay. There you are. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thanks, Ray. Um, so we're going to go ahead and pop over to the Q&A section. Uh, if you're not taking advantage of that, please do. Uh, right now we are answering in real time, but then also any that are directed towards the panelists will try and uh, ping over here. Uh, so this, it looks like this question is for Abby Foley. Um, and Abby, the uh, question is, if I have a friend that would make a great CASA volunteer, um, how can they learn more? Great question. Um, so I am, please give them my information. I am happy to chat with them over the phone or over a video call and I can go in detail about the CASA volunteer role. They can also attend one of our virtual CASA 101 sessions. Either way, they will get the same level of information and same level of support. And I can leave my uh, email address and phone number in the chat box so you can send that over. Perfect. Thank you, Abby, so much. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Ray, for the third and final panel. Great. Thank you. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce this last panel of speakers. And our focus uh, this evening will be on economy and sustainability. Our first panelist is Tom Clark, who is an expert in his field, having retired as the CEO of the Metro Denver Economic Development Corporation. Tom led the Regional Economic Development Office for the past 14 years, 
serving as a key player in almost every single major business relocation and expansion along the front range. Tom is also an avid CASA supporter, knowing the financial impact of CASA has on the community, and he's also a proud Adams County resident. Uh, Don Tripp serves as the Westminster City Manager and, and, the leads, and leads the city with innovative strategies and, a, and an emphasis on community. Don also serves on the CASA Board of Directors, providing his expertise and guidance to aid the organization in growth and sustainability. And last but not least is our very own Executive Director of CASA, Lindsay Lehrman, um, who is approaching her seventh year with this fine organization. She is well versed in operations, business engagement and fundraising. Lindsay believes that community is key in growing the CASA organization. And so please join me in welcoming the, this panel. Um, our first question is for Mr. Tom Clark. How are, you, how are we ensuring that these critical programs like CASA are sustained with such a volatile economy? Well, Ray, it's, it's just like a whole new world. It seems like to be that we have another Great Depression. People are losing their homes, struggling with debt, paying their rents, all that stuff. But this is not the Great Depression, and it's not appearing to like it will reach the 25% unemployment rate as it did in 1933. At its worst, our challenge could go up to 20%. Let's understand that this is our country and that has gotten far, far richer than during the Great Depression. We are creative and adaptive. There's good news for those who stayed in the stock market, for example. Dow Jones has dropped about 14 and a half since the virus broke out. That's good news, that's not bad news. That means that Americans and Adams County folks are confident in our future. Nonetheless, um, the turnaround will take some time. CASA will need support to continue its help for our children who need help, and CASA will need money for its programs, its CASAs. We must understand that many things are changing, communications, education, the way we're learning, people working at home with something called Zoom, which we're <laughs> using right here. We will need to look for other means of, uh, to reach others who will work at home and can't easily be reached and help us. Business will be done in a new way. These changes that we're seeing right now will need other job skills to take advantage of the new world. And we'll need to trade capacity for these jobs here. Adams County, I don't know if all, everybody knows, that is the fastest growing county economy in Metro Denver. Yet still, it has some of the lowest family incomes. I predict that we will have a great advantage. <clears throat> the I-25 North Corridor is going, growing quickly. Good jobs are going to be there sooner than we think. The Casa, Casa kids can be this new generation of employees if we can continue to help them. Mm -hmm. Here are my th thoughts on Adams and Broomsfield's Casa programs. Number one, as we pull out of this thing, tax revenues going to local governments and local school districts will be less than it's been. These sources will have less financial help because they will be struggling for money to run their own governments. It will take a couple of years for governments and businesses to catch up. The second thing is the state legislature will be facing similar cha challenges. They'll be looking for federal funds and we have gotten some, however. Uh, they probably slimmed down to the state's funds going to local governments. Mm -hmm. Three, small and large companies just get back on, on their feet, will wait for support to CASA awaiting to see if their company will survive. Number four, our citizens will continue to support CASA. Maybe not with so much cash, but in kind. Other gifts that will help us find needs for CASA. Number five, companies that receive help from the feds, the state and local governments will look to the power for such help. We will need to continue them to help and that's something you've been doing in the last couple of several about the month with the business schools. And finally, in number six, I believe that those Adams County citizens who lost some of their assets can be the group to keep CASA growing and supporting these children need your help. I know you think I'm nuts here, okay? But each of us is committed as uh, many of us. We should be the first to increase our financial support for this incredible organization, its staff, its volunteers, and, and who are not paid, those of us not on the payroll, and who will toil for these kids who need someone that's their champion and best supporter. 
I'm asking all of you to stay with your commitment to CASA and increase it for the next two years. It is an extraordinary program for abused and neglected kids, and it's an investment. We can pay now or pay later if they don't get if they don't receive the uh, the help they need. Without CASA's help, they will become a drain on our economy. CASA reduces the cost of governments for social services, provides one single adult voice for a child who know who knew so no such thing when the first CASA walked into their child and into their life. Thanks to all of you who work for CASA every day. Great, thank you, Tom. What a powerful message and um, words of encouragement in terms of really, um, you know, stressing the importance of, of uh, continuing um, our investment into CASA over the next two years. So thank you, Tom. This next question is for Don. Don, you are the city manager of a major city in Colorado. Um, the first question is, why did you choose to join the CASA board over so many other opportunities that you were presented with? And then second is, what would you say to the folks participating in this call today about the importance of the sustainability of the CASA program? Well, Ray, thank you. And thank you, uh, uh, CASA staff, for inviting me to be involved. Um, I am a member of the board. Uh, Ray, I just want to take a minute to thank you for your leadership in Adams County. Uh, you've been assisting all of us managers in the various cities uh, with, with, with working our way through this issue, both economically and socially, and I really appreciate your leadership. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, yeah, I've been in, I've been in uh, Colorado eight years. I've been in Westminster during that time uh, as Parks and Recreation Libraries Director and now City Manager for the last five years. And, you know, I've noticed that this is an economy and a social fabric in Colorado that is very dependent upon the nonprofit communities to serve uh, all of our people. As a city manager of a city that, um, you know, has limitations in terms of uh, dollars that we have available and, and wants to use those wisely, you know, I have a lot of respect for, admiration for, and need for uh, a number of nonprofit organizations that fill voids, that provide support in our community to various organizations. I spent um, three years on the Ralston House Board. Uh, that was a, a choice that I made because of our relationship uh, uh, in the police department with Ralston House and the great work they do. And while I was doing that, I became familiar with CASA uh, and that uh, part of the spectrum of service to, to children. Uh, I guess I would say too that I, I have a lifetime of service to kids. I have uh, seven of my own. I have 14 grandchildren, you know, and I think our future really has an awful lot to do with how successful these young people are. Uh, CASA offers opportunities that I think are unmatched to help people when they need a hand up. And so I, uh, I agree to come on the board. The second thing I want to say is that, you know, you want to spend your time in organizations that are effective, uh, well run, have good business plans and have inspirational leadership. And CASA has all that from their executive director uh, through their entire staff and through the, the board members that, you, that, that uh, they have uh, led by Bob Grant. It was just a pleasure to, jo to join that group. So thinking about the future and sustainability, um, this, is a, this is an interesting time. I don't know that any of us can say for certain the things that are happening in our world today uh, how, how they affect the sustainability of all organizations. I will say this, the nonprofit community uh, is under threat right now because of the economy the way it is. And, and as Tom Clark, my good friend and colleague pointed out, you know, this is a very interesting time, but it's a time that we've all got to step forward and set priorities. And I'm going to tell you that my priorities are with kids. My priorities are investing in that future because I think um, you know, my generation has done some good things. We've screwed some things up. And here we are today, uh, going to pass the gavel to people who are going to run this world from here to four. And uh, I want to make sure that every one of those kids has an opportunity to do it um, from a very good starting place. So thanks for the chance to be here today. Thank you, Don. Uh, moving on to the next question, Lindsay. How has CASA been impacted financially by COVID-19? 
Thank you, Ray. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you so much, Don and Tom. Your, your answers were beautiful and I just really appreciate it. Uh, but to answer your question, uh, Ray, uh, while we have been able to move program operations nearly seamlessly to, remote, to a remote environment, um, our fundraising events are not as conducive to going vir virtual. Uh, for the past several years, the Westminster 710 Rotary has named CASA a beneficiary of their annual roast with our organization receiving 50% of the proceeds. Uh, that event was scheduled for March 28th, has been rescheduled to August 22nd. Our CASA Classic is our annual golf fundraiser. Uh, this is scheduled for June 2nd. Um, it is moving forward, but it has been modified from tournament shotgun style to individual tee times. Uh, we're hoping that many people will be excited to get outside, to play on the country club course, and to support CASA in this way. We are working with the ranch to ensure social distancing and safe measures are put in place. Um, if you are a golfer, we encourage you to come join us and have fun. Uh, we also made the decision to move our Indulge for Casa Gala event at Bowsery Vineyards to September 17th. Uh, but we are working through changes and restrictions in, uh, with event planning, uh, with our social distancing, and are currently developing ideas for an event which will offer our guests a special, more intimate experience. Uh, so please look at all event updates in our email communication and on our website. And if you have any questions, you know, feel free to reach out to me uh, as well. Uh, the change in our events, um, as well as our canceled or deferred grant opportunities, have left us in a bit of a shortfall for our, our operating budget. Uh, the good news is that we now have a working plan for events as noted above. Uh, many of our grants will still come through. They are just a bit delayed. And uh, we were able to obtain a loan to help cover personal expenses uh, through the Paycheck Protection Program uh, that's part of the Federal CARES Act. This loan will actually convert to a grant for us uh, since we will use the funds only for personal salaries as, as intended. Uh, finally, and most excitingly, uh, we have many donors support us with one-time donations um, over the last few months. Uh, many of them are first-time donors to CASA and this really just illustrates um, our growing reach in the community, and I'm really excited about that. Great. Lindsay, I just have to congratulate you in terms of really, you know, having a grip on, um, you know, responding to COVID. And, you know, I know, as uh, Don mentioned, you know, nonprofits are struggling uh, as, as we go through and face this crisis. So you're doing a, a phenomenal job, and I just want to thank you for your leadership during this time. Um, our last question and um, is for you, Don. Uh, from a board member's perspective, uh, what final thoughts do you have for this group? Well, as a board member, um, I guess I'd have to say that um, for those of us that are so fortunate to be employed and to not be impacted um, in the way that some are that have lost jobs, 30 million people in this country. Um, I think it's time to share it. It's time to be generous uh, of our time, of our talents, and of our money. And I'm just, I'm gonna emphasize again that, um, you know, it's very, very important that we come out of the back end of this event uh, and we move into the future with a solid foundation of the mix of government, private industry, and nonprofit organizations. Uh, and the nonprofits will need our help right now. So, you know, um, in my role as a city manager and my role as a board member, um, that's the commitment that I have and I'd ask others to, to really deep, uh, dig deep inside their hearts and, uh, and ask themselves, what is it that they can do to secure our future? Great, thank you, Don. I'll turn it over to you, Lindsay. Perfect, all right, thanks, Ray. We'll go into the Q&A session um, for one last one to wrap us up and let's see here. It looks like um, the last question, oh, and my lights shut off. Um, the last question uh, is, oh, it's for myself. And it's asking, uh, the attendee is asking, oh, it's a simple question, just how can I help? So the biggest way to help is simply talk about CASA, educate those around you by sharing on social media, um, share your personal journey uh, with the organization and encourage others to step up and volunteer and or support in some way. Uh, please visit our website at casa17th.org, like us on Facebook, um, and nominate individuals that have a passion for children to become a CASA volunteer. That will really all help um, in that as well. Uh, but before we close uh, with the panel portion, I would like to launch another poll at this time about CASA and COVID. As you complete the poll, I want to share how much of an honor it is to live and work um, in such an incredible community with amazing leaders that we have heard from today. 
I would like to especially thank Ray Gonzalez and all of the panelists for sharing about your respective landscapes during COVID-19. As it was mentioned earlier, community is key for success of CASA and the children engaged in the child welfare system. Um, I am continuously in awe of the community and the generosity and dedication shown to this program. Uh, we need many more individuals to step up and advocate for the children and youth. So if you're not already a CASA volunteer, please consider signing up today. Uh, but to end our formal presentation this evening, I am so pleased to introduce Jewel Arledge. Uh, many of you may recognize Jewel. She, she is a former CASA youth and a tremendous ambassador for our program. Uh, we are grateful that she is willing to share her story and inspire us through the challenges she has faced and overcome um, and her aspirations. So please help me welcome Jewel. Jewel, thank you so much for jumping on this call today. I really appreciate it. Um, and, and just love to see your beautiful face as always. Um, <laughs> So welcome. I would love for you just to start by just sharing a, a brief overview, overview of, um, you know, your background with CASA and, and uh, with your uh, background with Charlene, who was your CASA volunteer and when she came into your life. Absolutely. First of all, Lindsay, I just have to say thank you because once again, I'm astonished with the amazing individual you are. And of course, being a CASA kid, CASA kid myself, there has been so much concern in this time because I know that kids are stuck at home and sometimes it's not good situations. And um, that's why I'm so grateful for you guys. Sorry, getting a little emotional. But to answer your question, um, my journey with CASA started when I was 15 years old. I was placed in uh, foster care due to my mother. Our childhood, my sister and I was absolute insanity, every form of abuse and just unbelievable conditions. And trust me, I know how daunting it could be to be stuck in a place with somebody who doesn't respect you as being a human. So it is so important that we keep an eye out for these kids. But I met Charlene being placed in foster care. I remember sitting in a room full of individuals that I had never met before. And they were going around introducing people and where they were in my life now, their new part, um, due to the fact that everything changed because the crazy thing to me is this pandemic is not the first time these kiddos were, these kiddos world have been turned upside down and their resilience is just commendable. And I remember back to my story. I remember, um, they introduced Charlene and she looked unbelievably familiar. And after the chaos and them introducing everyone, she came over to me and she said, Hey, I remember you. And it was so interesting because her and I had actually met prior she had substituted for one of my classes in high school and I had introduced myself and welcomed her to the classroom. And it was just so crazy to me because that showed me that they are literally every part of our community. She was my teacher and now she was my friend. And it was just crazy that there was that familiarity, there was that comfortability. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that, Jewel. And um, I'd just like to ask, you know, what items or what things that you would like to know, where are you now? Uh, share, you know. Uh, yeah, what... absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so currently, um, Charlene and I still do keep in contact, which is amazing. We're friends on Facebook. Her and my sister still have contact. You know, we talk about all the kiddos in our life. Uh, her and I have to do coffee soon. Actually, her and Jade, which is my sister that I was in the foster care system with. Also, Charlene was her casa seeing each other not too long ago, which is totally amazing. She knows, I mean, everything. We haven't lost contact since the day I emancipated out of the system. And I know that if I need to call her, if I have any questions, concerns, or if I just want to talk to my friend, she's going to be there. And I can say without a doubt that I love her and she loves me. We have that relationship. We built that rapport. And because of her, because of this organization and the unbelievable amount of people that are willing to stand and fight for these kiddos, I get to do amazing things. I work, I go to school, I do my speaking, and it's amazing. It's so much wonderful things occur constantly. I am in double majoring in business communications and going for my juris, business communications and philosophy and going for my juris doctorate in corporate law. I actually interned under Judge Delgado, who was on the call earlier, which is amazing. She is one of my favorite people in the world, and I would have to say, I can't imagine how she th she's feeling right now because I remember how important it was for her to talk to children and that is just so wonderful for me and knowing that we have these applications that allow us to still be present is so important and continue to grow every day, working every day towards my dreams and trying to spread the message of this wonderful organization because oftentimes I get asked, you know, how did your cost affect you? And my cost was amazing. She's one of my closest friends and she affected me because she was there. You know, when you're a kiddo and you have 
no previous experience of somebody who genuinely cares about you and an individual comes along and asks about your day or if you have made any new friends or projects in school it shows you that it's so much more than just a case to them you're a person and like judge delgado said you know she wanted that picture it means something to put a name to the face because it was heartbreaking to me the first time i recognized that i was you know technically under some sort of file there was it felt dehumanizing and then i met an array of people that made me feel not even human but you know goddess like you guys made me transcend normality because of the love and support not only from my casa but the entire organization i know that if i need anything i have a list of contacts including lindsay and vicky that i can reach out to because it's a family it's a lifelong commitment that you guys have to these kids that even though we didn't get the normal parents the normal way we still have a crew of people who love us and want to see us flourish and it's absolutely correct that the world we create today is the one our kiddos live in tomorrow and we have to create a good one so that they continue to create an amazing world in situations like this pandemic get handled with the grace and maturity and execution that Lindsay did with Casa so far. I've just been unbelievably impressed and I again am so grateful to be a part of this and I am proud to be a Casa kid because of my Casa volunteer and all the Casa volunteers. I wear that like a golden medal that I was a Casa kid and nobody can ever take that from me because I know that that means I have support and I have people looking out for me. Regardless if I'm eight or 80, you guys will always be there and I know that. Absolutely. Wow. Joel, you are an incredible inspiration. You have such a way with your words that's just truly really beautiful. And so thank you so much for joining us here today um, and just sharing those thoughts. I, I just, I can't say thank you enough and just sincerely appreciate it. I know we have a lot of Casa volunteers on this call and I will tell you that if there's any sort of reinforcement for them doing the, the advocacy role that they're committed to right now, that's it. So thank you so much. Yeah, um, absolutely. Let me just say it's thank you to all the cost volunteers. And I know that there are bad days and we see a lot of bad situations, but trust me when I say every minute, every dollar, every ounce of commitment changes lives. So thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. And uh, you of course. are welcome to stay. We are about to transition into the uh, general question and answer. And if you would like to stay, I'm sure you'll be fielding some questions as well. If you can't, we completely understand. Uh, but I just want to say thank you again so much for joining us for this portion of it. Um, and with that, I will go ahead and and transition over. Um, our, our CASA organization um, is continuing to thrive even during this pandemic. Um, and the children we serve will also continue to thrive thanks to the creativity and commitment of our amazing CASA volunteers. Um, so I wanna say thank you again for all joining, for um, all of you joining this formal presentation. We will now turn to the general question and answer session, which we will be reviewing questions via the Q&A text box in your toolbar. Uh, the panelists are invited to stay if you are able, uh, but the CASA staff will certainly be here and will be available to answer all questions as well. Um, so panelists and staff that will be participating in the question and answer session, if you wouldn't mind, go ahead and start your videos now so our attendees can see um, who's gonna be here and then they can direct those questions accordingly. Um, but we will go ahead and I'll switch over to the um, uh, technical to, to our Q&A um, and let's go ahead and just mute ourselves just, uh, that way uh, unless you're speaking and go ahead and then we can address questions as we're going so I'll start uh, it looks like these this first question is going to be directed towards Vicki Record our program director um, so Vicki this first question says looks like it's it's from a CASA volunteer and they are asking when should we plan to be able to visit in person uh, for our youth again so we are working right now, um, and I believe it's on the website already, after the May 8th um, or the May 9th lift of the stay at home order, we now have a safer at home order. Um, we've put some directives on, the, on our website that you are able to visit your children. There are just a lot of precautions that go into it. Um, so um, please feel free to take a look at that. It's, it's um, essentially making sure that the family is comfortable with it. Um, limiting, limiting the amount of, of times that people are going into homes uh, is helpful too. So making sure that you can go with your, uh, if you can, go with your guardian at litem or caseworker, making sure that you're wearing masks and, um, and uh, ensuring that there is uh, so, uh, 
personal distance uh, as well is a, is a huge thing. So um, just take a look at our website and um, there are a list of, of procedures and uh, precautions to take as we do begin to see our children again in the community. Okay, Vicki, you actually, this is gonna be shocking for you. <laughs> You've got one more. Um, it's, it's, and this one was answered via the Q&A, but I also wanna just say it out loud so any other participants know as well. It, uh, the question was, remind us how many cases still need CASA volunteers and how many current costs do you have right now? Right, so there are, in Adams and Broomfield counties, there are 1,600 kids um, in need of a CASA. Each year we serve a few, uh, just a little over 500. I think we'll, we'll be reaching that this year as well. Um, we are currently serving 475 children with 220 advocates, uh, 218, really close to 220. Um, so um, we are in need of a lot more advocates. Um, and like has been said before, Becca is doing an amazing job of doing our training virtually and our courts have been, and judicial officers have been so wonderful in um, completing our swearing ins online. It's just been um, a beautiful, seamless uh, way to continue advocating for our kids. I, I've just been overwhelmed with the ideas that our volunteers have come up with uh, to visit with their kids. And it can, you can still have your eyes on kids. To me, that's the biggest thing is we need every eye that we possibly can on our kids right now uh, and our families. Great, thank you so much, Vicki. Uh, this other, this uh, next question is for you, Abby, and I think you may have answered it in the uh, chat, but I'm gonna go ahead and have you answer it um, live as well. So it says, the question is, how and where do I get started? So great question. The first step is to fill out an online application, um, and that can be found on our website, or I can send it in an email. I do like to talk with people um, that are interested in becoming a CASA volunteer before filling out the application. So um, feel free to get in touch with me via email or phone and I would be happy to chat with you more. Perfect, thanks Abby. And I think this next one's gonna be uh, for you as well. Um, or actually this one, actually this, is, this looks like it's more for Heidi. Sorry, I need to read through the whole question. <laughs> so Heidi, this question says, um, how can I help if I know I will be moving out of the state in a year? I would love to be a CASA, but do not want to disappoint a child uh, by forming an attachment and then leaving. Is there a way to donate uh, time in other ways? And so really this could be Abby and or uh, Heidi. Well, I'll jump in from the event side and then Abby, if you wanna talk through um, some other options, but we do have a number as uh, Lindsay had mentioned earlier, a number of fundraising events, um, which will require um, help with our golf tournament, with um, our gala, with balustrary. And so if you're inter interested in um, volunteering at one of our signature events, that would be a wonderful way. Um, Abby also has some opportunities with um, canvassing events, which if you'd like to jump in, you can talk about those. Yeah, absolutely. So we do uh, quarterly canvassing events where we hang flyers in the community in coffee shops, small businesses, libraries, really anywhere that will let us hang a flyer, we will hang it. Um, and then another really great way besides uh, volunteering at events, like Heidi said, is just to really spread the word and help us make connections in the community. We do a lot of presentations um, at HOA communities, places of worship, workplaces, um, again, anywhere that will let us talk. Um, so any introduction uh, that you can make, we really appreciate. Perfect. Thank you so much to you both. And thank you guys for keep sending the questions. I appreciate it. Uh, this next question, I think, will be for Vicki. And it's asking, will it be possible to transport our kiddo if we are both wearing masks? Good question. Good question. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know that we have addressed this specifically. I would say that no, um, as the safer at home um, order is still in place. We need to make sure that we're distancing from others that are within um, that are not within our family unit um, or our home unit. So until those um, those restrictions are lifted, I don't feel comfortable with CASAs transporting children. Right now, we're asking that if you do have a visit with your child, that it's done outside. Um, 
if possible, um, with social uh, distancing or personal distancing uh, precautions taken because we want to make sure that we're, we're um, still uh, being very careful about uh, being within someone's family unit in their home. Perfect. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and then this next question is asking, it says, not sure who could answer this question. If someone hasn't been on a case in some time, how do we, it sounds like this is a, a Abby question. If someone hasn't been on a case in some time, how do we get back involved? Do we contact our peer coordinator? So it's going to depend on how long it's been. Um, if you have been keeping up with your continuing education um, and have taken a case in if you correct me if I'm wrong, less than a year, um, then you can get back on a case. If it's been longer than that and you haven't um, been involved, then you'll have to complete the process again. So we can have you fill out an application and interview and um, go through training. So you can feel free to contact me um, and I can direct you depending on how long it's been. Perfect, thank you. And just as a reminder, I know Abby put it in the chat, but her email address is abby, A-B-B-I-E, at casa17th.com if you'd like to shoot her over an email. Um, and we have another one asking, when do we anticipate the courthouse returning to in-person hearings? That's for Vicki. Currently, and I don't think Judge Delgado is uh, here, but currently, um, the courthouse is uh, closed except to emergency hearings. So um, right now, um, it is <laughs> June 16th, I believe, um, but it could uh, for DNN cases to be heard in person. Those things change from week to week, so keep, um, keep an eye out. That being said, um, even if the court does open, if our volunteers feel uncomfortable coming into the courthouse um, and being uh, within that smaller area of the courtroom. Um, the, uh, the judicial officers have assured us that they're comfortable with people still calling in um, via conference line for their hearings. Perfect, thank you so much, Vicki. And we will go ahead and wrap up with one final question where it looks like we're right at our end time, so perfect timing. Um, and let's see here, sorry, I'm toggling back and forth right now on what our last questions are. Um, you know, is uh, Bob Grant still on the line? It looks like this one was, I don't think so. Nope, that's okay, no problem. Um, how about uh, Abby for a question? Um, this question is, uh, how do uh, partner teams work within CASA for volunteering? So I'm thinking this is like friends or how does that look? Yeah, great question. So um, we have, various kinds of partner teams. Um, and how that works is you would both apply, uh, interview separately and go through training. And then um, what's different about it is you are assigned to the same case. So you are working a case together. Um, and really what's nice about that is you can kind of share the, share the case together. Um, you can make decisions together, visit the kids together. Um, and you can also share the burden of the role. So if someone can't um, attend to the court hearing, someone else, the other person can go in the place. Um, we do ask a couple, couple things of our partner teams. Um, one, that they take a case with more than one child, which the majority of our cases do have more than one child, um, sibling pairs, and then also that they're equally involved. Um, so one person shouldn't be doing all of the work. They should be uh, collaborating and working together. Perfect. Thank you so much, Abby, for answering that. I really appreciate it. Um, so with that last question, we will go ahead and wrap up. And I just want to say thank you all again for joining our State of CASA address. Uh, we have enjoyed our time here with each of you, and we will plan to follow up with an email that captures the questions asked today. Um, I just want to thank you for your commitment to CASA and the children in our community. Uh, please have a wonderful evening, and we hope to see you soon. Good night.